Melissa Partika is a doctoral candidate in the graduate group in ecology at UC Davis and a staff research associate in the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security. She is interested in the spatial dynamics of waterborne pathogens and their transmission through freshwater and marine systems. She is currently involved in several projects focused on the persistence of pathogens in the environment and the improvement of statistical methods to model pathogen prevalence in natural systems. So with that, thank you, Melissa. Hello. As Kathy said, I work at UC Davis. I'm at the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security, emphasis on University of California, so I apologize if some of the things I talk about today don't necessarily apply to Wyoming, but I think a lot of them, being Western states, will work well together. Um, as I said, I'm not from Wyoming, but um, I'm assuming you guys have cows. We've got a lot of cows in California. In fact, we have a lot of cows in California. We have a lot of cows and we have a lot of public land, and about 80 mil 8 million acres of that public land is actually allocated or has allotments for grazing on it. It's a valuable tool for grazers, cattle ranchers, to be able to use public lands for grazing. Either they don't have the water rights to be able to irrigate meadows themselves, they don't have enough property to graze their cattle on, but they are frequently grazed on public lands. Um, the only time that starts to become an issue is when those public lands intersect watersheds, and that's common. And I'm sure you guys have heard, and I understand you guys are dealing with it too, there's a little bit of a drought going on. And there being a drought going on means people get really particular about water. And when you start having cattle intersecting with water, then you get people's hackles raised a little bit. So right now there's a lot of public debate that's going on about the intersection of cattle, public lands, watershed management, passionate debate on both sides of the issue. Some people feel that cattle should be kicked out of areas, especially in areas that have watersheds of concern. Maybe they're used for drinking water, they're used for irrigation water. On the other side, plenty of people feel that the practice of grazing cattle on public lands um, is a way of restoring and preserving natural resources and a way of life in the West. Regardless of what side of the fence you are on the issue, um, all of us talking about it raises a lot of public concern and the public perception ends up governing a lot of the science that goes on out there. So some people feel very strongly pro, some people feel very strongly against, and then we have people like my uh, collaborators right here stuck in the middle that are being accused by the Sacramento Bee of siding with cattle grazing because their science doesn't agree with the environmentalists. That all being said, um, I am a scientist. Many of us are scientists, and we care about the science behind these things and not necessarily the politics behind them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of monitoring these watersheds today, what we know, what we don't know, and what we can do kind of moving forward. So as I said, a lot of these watersheds are being co-managed for grazing, they're used for um, irrigation, they're used for drinking water, but all of these uh, Beneficial uses means that somebody has to come in and actually manage them. And managing frequently means that they have to be monitored some way. So the big question is when you're monitoring is like, why is it that you want to monitor? Why are these regulatory agencies doing any monitoring? Protection of the beneficial uses. You want to make sure that not only are people able to drink the water, swim in the water, irrigate with the water, but that cattle are still able to use that land and graze in that area and water from it as well. Um, there's a big issue about securing public health, so whether or not there are actual public health concerns comes into play there. Some of these um, grazing allotments and watersheds um, don't have a, an intersection with a public health issue, so they might be managed just a little bit differently. There's not a lot of people out there, or maybe the water isn't used for drinking. But really, what it comes down to is that once all this monitoring happens, decisions have to be made about uh, how the land is going to be managed. So then we really come down to then, okay, if it's gonna come down to public health and management decisions, what should we monitor for? And really, if we're talking about public health, pathogens are what we're concerned about, the things that actually make people sick. And the problem with that is that pathogens are rare, they're um, difficult to test for, there's a lot of different assays out there, um, and it's expensive to do so. So while it might make sense to be actually looking for pathogens that make people ill, um, that might not always be a cost-effective strategy. So 
for 100 years now nearly, we've been monitoring for indicator bacteria, fecal indicator bacteria, and bacteria that are found commonly associated with feces might be easy to find out in the environment, but the problem is that they don't usually correlate very well with actual pathogens. So then that begs the question of why are we monitoring for them, and I'll talk a little bit more about that also. But in more recent years, we're starting to see the advent of host-specific genetic monitoring. So we're actually looking for monitor, um, markers for particular uh, genes or DNA traits that tell us what is the source of that fecal contamination. And we'll talk about um, where the science is behind that right now. I won't go too far into the laboratory methods or details. It sounds like Lucy's going to talk more about that too. Um, and I apologize if I step on the other speakers if you're talking about some of these yeah, things. Like yeah, that's fine. Um, but we'll go through each of these things in a little bit more depth. To get us all on the same page, though, I want to be clear what I'm saying when I say pathogens. When I talk about pathogens, at least in the context of this talk, is I'm talking about waterborne zoonotic pathogens. So these are pathogens that are found in animals, um, livestock and wildlife and birds, um, and they are transmitted to humans frequently by a waterborne route. So there's defecation of feces, it's transferred to water, and then it makes its way to humans. So when I talk about pathogens, this is what I'm referring to. When I talk about bacterial indicators, this is what I'm referring to. I'm talking about a whole suite of organisms that are associated with the feces of vertebrates. Um, they go from very broad to total coliforms, which are found throughout the environment and are not generally just associated with feces. Fecal coliforms, smaller group, subset of that, that are generally thermal tolerant, so are thought to be more associated with feces, but are still a huge range of organisms specific bacteria, E. coli, saying that, okay, we're looking for this species of bacteria that we know is found in feces, but can also propagate in the environment and persist for long periods of time post-defecation. And then there's the little pathogens down in there. Right there, a little outbreak strain that I'm talking about. Go back. This little outbreak strain. So these are the pathogens we're actually talking about, or tiny little subset of these indicators, what we're looking for. So when I talk about bacterial indicators, this is what I mean. The problem with bacterial indicators, though, is that there are a lot of different kinds of bacterial indicators. Total coliforms, fecal coliforms, E. coli, enterococcus. And they're all applied differently depending on the regulatory agency that's using them. Um, EPA is the regulatory group that is usually driving a lot of the regulation out there in water. A lot of different agencies adopt EPA methods. Um, and EPA just changed their methods in 2014, in, or in terms of their standards, what they're looking at. Whether or not they're looking at geometric means, so you're talking about uh, a rolling series of samples that they take the mean on, or the statistical threshold value um, determines like what, how much concentration of these bacteria in the water are going to raise a red flag and say that we've got something to worry about. And even between different districts on one side of the border, over in California, the Lahontan Regional District and the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, um, monitoring basically the same watersheds, one has an incredibly stringent criteria of E. coli not to exceed 20 CFU, while the other one says 126, even though now the EPA standard is up to 410. So um, it can be pretty confusing. And because of that, uh, there's science that says all kinds of manner of um, things about the use of indicators. But I'm hoping that through some of the science that I talk about today, I can help inform you a little bit better and help you make some more um, educated decisions. So the third thing that people are monitoring for, microbial source host-specific markers, um, there's also a wide range of things that we could be talking about in ins this instance. They're usually broken down into three kind of categories. There's library dependent, culture dependent. There's a library independent, culture dependent. And there's library independent, culture independent. And those are all kind of big terms that say like either you're going to have a whole source of bacterial samples to begin with, you're going to culture up your bacteria and you're going to compare them. You're going to have some kind of um, online database, maybe not a microbial source library, and then you're going to culture up your bacterial and compare maybe their genotypes to one another and see if they match, or you're going to not culture anything and you're going to do direct extraction from the environment, and then you're going to compare that to known markers for those organisms. 
for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the latter, what is library independent and culture independent down here, and this is the thing that's been adopted to by the e EPA, that's the use of Bacteroides um, microbial source markers. So talking about Bacteroides, um, different terms get thrown around about Bacteroides. There's Bacteroidetes, there's Bacteroidales, there's Bacteroides, and they all kind of talk about a different group of organisms. Bacteroides specifically is a genus. Um, Bacteroidales is a larger group of organisms, so it means you've got a lot of different species. And as soon as you start talking about a lot of different species, just like with the fecal coliforms or the total coliforms, you might have behavioral differences of those organisms in the environment. So it's something to keep in mind. The host markers that you might use if you're choosing to adopt an MST approach, um, if they're meant to target Bacteroidales, a larger group of organisms, they might behave a little bit differently than if you're targeting specific species Bacteroides. So one of the reasons they like to use them for microbial source tracking is because there's a high degree of host specificity, generally speaking. So um, these bacteroides that are in the gut of a human versus those that are in the gut of a cow, they're going to have characteristics that make them distinctive, which means you can develop primers and probes or develop detection methods to help differentiate between those um, components of fecal contamination. So as I said, though, the problem is that there's a lot of different regulatory agencies out there and different government um, interests in what it is that you're going to be monitoring for. So in your individual districts or your groups, you might not have a choice about what it is that you're actually going to monitor for. That might be dictated to you. So what I'm going to talk about now is not just what you're monitoring for, but how you're going to monitor for it, because that might be where you have the greatest amount of control and leniency. Basically, how you're developing your monitoring strategy and how that actually impacts the outcome of your monitoring. We've been studying, my group has been studying um, indicators and pathogens and, and just started doing MST you know, for decades now. And um, so we've got a lot of data, and all of the data generally point to the same thing that indicators don't indicate. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I will go through each of these things that I consider the most important when determining a monitoring methodology and the implications that it has for your outcomes is where you sample, when you sample, how you sample, and then what you're testing for at the end. So like I said, generally speaking, um, in the ideal world, if you're monitoring for an indicator, as the word implies, it should be indicative of something. You should be able to say, if I'm getting this number of bacteria, then I should have this many pathogens to go with it in a linear relationship. Or at the very least, you could say, maybe at low levels of indicator bacteria, I don't have a very strong correlation, but there's some threshold that is reached that I rapidly start seeing higher numbers of pathogens. And this whole threshold idea is where the EPA starts setting criteria or other groups set criteria with the idea that saying once you exceed a sp specific margin, then your probability of getting a pathogen is higher. But that's idealized. In the real world, generally speaking, there's basically no correlation at all. It's all over the place. You could have high pathogen numbers when you got really low indicators. And while there might be a threshold that actually exists after which you have correlation, chances are that um, threshold is actually associated with particular conditions. Maybe it's a rainfall event. Maybe you had um, a whole herd of cattle passing through at a particular time. Maybe you had a septic leak, but that usually specifically associated with something. So it's not all the time when you're monitoring that you would expect to see a threshold. So that's something to keep in mind too, is that yes, you might see papers or you might hear studies where you actually have correlations and they showed good connectivity between indicators and pathogens, but it's important to keep in mind what was the time scale over which that study took place? What was the spatial scale over which those studies took place? And did it have to do with something specifically happening in time? or in space. For example, this study that was conducted um, a couple of years ago, I guess in 06, by Ken Tate, was actually looking at the correlation between indicators and pathogens on rangeland. And not surprising, he found that there wasn't much of a correlation at all. So this is just looking at Cryptosporidium parvum in water samples out in rangeland. And you can see, kind of like looking at my other graph here, we don't really have a correlation. This is even worse right here. You've got all these indicators all the way out to 800 CFU, where this is the current recommended standard 410 of the EPA. Back when this study was done, it was 235 down here. But you had your highest concentration 
of cryptosporidium, we had almost zero indicator E. coli. And over here, like most of the pathogens were found, five out of 75, like most of the time they were found when it was below the regulatory standard compared to above. That leads all of us to think, us scientists to think, like what are regulators thinking when they continue to you know, adhere to this um, standard. But the fact of the matter is, is that they have to monitor for something, they have to set a standard somewhere, and we have to have a starting point. Um, and then we as scientists have to keep poking holes in it. One of the reasons we see such a huge degree of variability, though, is because, as I said, there are temporal and spatial issues out there. There's solar cycles and tidal processes and um, animal tracks and um, hydrology and all these things come into play and alter the occurrence of pathogens and the occurrence of indicators out in the environment. And this huge degree of variability makes finding any correlation between the two incredibly difficult. So I want you to really keep in mind these big temporal and spatial drivers of variability throughout the rest of the talk and really through your decision making when you're designing your MST. So I'll start going through these big things that I think about, starting with where your sampling matters. Whether you're talking about really broad scale, there's some studies that do transcontinental sampling to see if there's correlations across um, countries. Or you're looking at site specific, whether or not you know, between two parcels of land looking down a stream, do you actually see correlations then? Maybe it's just an issue of scale. So the EPA compiled some data when they were putting together this document to help uh, TMDL development, and they basically found that really where your sampling matters. So looking at New Hampshire versus South Dakota, if you're developing an MST and you're looking at a watershed that's in New Hampshire, maybe you don't want to develop one that's specific to bovine or specific to horses. Um, you got a big avian influence in the watershed out there. Out in South Dakota, you don't see any avian showing up in here at all, but looks like sheep might be a big problem. Once again, bovine, a small contribution. So when people start saying MST and they're saying, it's the cows, we gotta look for a bovine signature, we need to really focus on the fecal contamination associated with livestock ranging, then it's important to consider um, where it is that you're taking these samples um, and under what context you're taking these samples and what the possible other contributing sources might be in that region. Um, without having these ideas of what the contributors are out there, you might really just be putting a lot of resources to not find very many answers. Now on a small scale difference, a study we conducted a few years ago looking at um, coastal estuaries, looking at these five different five different rivers along the coast right here, wanted to look at what are the small scale contributors to variability that you see in the occurrence of pathogens in indicator. And we're talking real small scale, not just across these rivers, but actually going all the way down to like the subsample size. So we took samples at multiple spots along the river and then at multiple locations across the river. So from one bank to the other and right in the middle and then down through the water column and then included sediment samples for the underlying sediment as well. And then within an individual sample, this little parcel right here broke it down into the different fractions of the water, whether or not it was actually in the water, the suspended particles that were in the water, and then also compared those down to the, the sediment samples down below to figure out you know, what portion of the water, is it something that's being transported rapidly um, because it's really lightweight? Could it be if it's heavier organic particles or sediments that they would settle out earlier on in a watershed? And I don't have all the data up there. I'd be happy to, happy to give you this paper right here. Um, long story short, it mattered. Like where you sample matters, where along the reach you sampled matters, which watershed you were in mattered in terms of how much bacteria you were getting, the frequency of loading, and then even the fraction of the water that you were sampling in. You see like in terms of the amount of bacteria in a single sample, on average, most of it was in that suspended solids fraction, the little particles that are floating around in the water, not in the water itself. So it means that most of the bacteria they're finding are particle associated. So it might be a good thing to think about, are you in an area where there's a lot of sediment contribution or organics being contributed to the water because they might be a great vehicle for moving bacteria through your system versus you have relatively clear water. Um, there's not that many bacteria, generally speaking, in a lot of studies we've done, that many bacteria floating 
um, unassociated throughout the water. They have a tendency to associate themselves with particles. So then when you sample also matters. In a study we're conducting right now up in some irrigation districts in Washington, we had the privilege of actually being up there while they were conducting a priming event. So essentially they have their canals dry through the whole entire winter, and at some point they turn the water on and they have to flush out the system to begin the irrigation season. And we like to think about it as being there when a river starts. So you have completely dry conditions and you're starting the river and trying to see um, how the bacteria respond over that time frame. And we went through different stretches all the way down, you know, like 20 miles down um, the canal district. And what this little graph is showing you right here, this is at the beginning of the canal, this is down towards the end of the canal, is obviously when that water first pulsed through, you had a huge spike it went through. But as you went further on down the canal, the baseline levels that they returned to gradually kept getting higher and higher. So once again, it's where you sample, but also when you sample. If there's a big storm event or there's a big um, snow melt that's going on, you might catch a big slug of this stuff as it's going through the system. But does that necessarily tell you about the nature of the system or where areas might be of greatest concern? Maybe that was a singularity. So that's something to consider also, like when in space, when in time. And you're going to hear me talk about this a lot. It's hard to parse out space and time. They're kind of intermingled without getting into physics. But um, temporal spatial variability is something you really need to be considering. So in that study as well, we continued monitoring in those canals and some more down in California over the course of several months. And we're still just finished monitoring down there. But once again, we see differences is that each time we went there, it was getting higher and higher throughout the season. But there were differences in between the districts. So you have spatial differences. California versus Washington differences. You have temporal differences that are going on. So you might want to be thinking about your temporal regularity of the sampling that you're doing, the spatial regularity of the sampling you're doing, in order to best capture what is your uh, primary concern, what are your biggest questions that you have out there. But it's important for you to consider this range of variability before you start going out and taking samples. So that's in an irrigation district, but we see the same kind of thing on rangeland. So looking at another study that we just um, were completing this summer, um, looking at uh, water flowing through rangeland, and again, we're in a drought, so you don't necessarily have connectivity between the rangeland and the water columns right now. But you see the same thing, is that what time of year you're sampling in matters, and then what location it is that matters. You know, whether or not you're going to have higher flow and therefore higher values at this particular time of year, but we also see an alternative. When you've got higher flows, you might see lower bacteria loading because it's got flushing going through there. Um, but your individual system is going to drive that, and so I can't, I can't tell you how your system is going to behave, but it is something to take into consideration. Now all of that is for actual bacteria, looking at bacteria moving through a system, but others have found that this is actually true also for um, host-specific markers. So this study was conducted by Oyofuso et al. in Washington in some intertidal creeks, and they were monitoring for human um, markers and for ruminant markers out in these intertidal streams over the course of several months. And these are like the different streams down here, so that's the color loading on here. And no surprise, they found seasonal differences. Whether or not you had a lot of rain going on and you have flushing that's occurring, or maybe you've got more sunny days in August, and so you have a big depression in the amount of bacteria or markers that you're actually seeing out there. So the fact of the matter is, is that even these markers are behaving similarly to what we're seeing the bacteria behave. Not surprising, because the markers are from bacteria. but keeping in mind that we're not entirely sure if these markers that we're seeing right here, if you're actually, um, if they are behaving like bacteria, if they're attenuating like bacteria, are they growing in the environment? Because we're looking for a genetic marker. We're not looking for a culturable organism. So we don't know if they're alive or not when we're sampling these things. So finally, how you sample matters as well. Um, this is an example of some samples that we took in some uh, lettuce fields down in California. And the, it's kind of hard to see, but they're like multicolored right here. So we take large volumes of samples, large volume samples, but each one had its own little color associated with it because it depended on the turbidity of the system. 
So unfortunately, a lot of uh, regulatory agencies are usually doing small volume sampling, 10 to 100 mils, or some other groups out there do small volume sampling. Um, it's easy to get a lot of samples at a single period in time. Um, they're easy to transport that way. You're forced by regulation to sample that way, or you're going to an independent lab and they require 100 mil samples. Um, but there has been some question about whether or not a 100 mil sample, think about it, you're out there at a river, and you go, boop, and you take a 100 mil sample, less than your Mountain Dew over there of sample, and determine whether or not that's a representative sample of what's occurring in your water. Like, it's hard to believe that. But then the question is, well, which volume is representative? You know, is it 10 liters? Is it 20 liters? Do you need, you know, 100, 100 mil samples to be able to actually characterize your water? These are still questions that we cannot answer yet, so the research is continuing. What I can tell you is this, looking at 100 mil samples, this is a, a huge study that we conducted in the California Delta where we had 88 monitoring sites that we sampled over two years, nearly 2,000 data points, and we got enterococcus concentrations down here versus salmonella up here. And you can see, once again, like here was the regulatory threshold at the time, very poor correlation between enterococcus and salmonella in these 100 mil sample conditions. You have highest salmonella when you have the lowest enterococcus. However, in another study that we did actually looking at on-farm reservoirs and tailwater um, recovery basins, we found that it, it did start to correlate when you changed your volumes that you were working in. So we did low volumes for, I keep hitting that, low volumes for E. coli, so we're doing like 100 mil samples for E. coli down here, but we did 20 liter samples for pathogens. So we're looking at how many, the presence of pathogens in a 20 liter sample correlated with the concentration of indicator bacteria in a 100 mil sample. And that's where you actually start to see a little bit of correlation. As soon as you start getting into the log two, so like hundreds and thousands of E. coli, you start to see an increase in the probability that you're actually gonna get salmonella. So maybe that's one of the problems that we're seeing all these studies where pathogens don't correlate with indicators is because we're not working on the right scales. Pathogens are rare, indicators are common, so maybe we need to start sampling separately for pathogens than we are sampling for indicators. <coughs> And as a side-by-side -side comparison, again, research that we're doing in uh, canals, um, looking in Washington and California, so these are actual samples taken at the same time, one liter grab samples, and then a subset of sites had additional 10 liter grab samples taken, so simultaneous sampling, different volumes that we're taking. And I want you to see right here that in Washington, this is on average between all the districts, in California between the districts, is you had 8% prevalence of salmonella in a one liter grab that you were taking. In the 10 liter grab, you had 44% prevalence overall. Like a big one here is this district two, you had 5% jumped up to 88%. Just by changing the volume of the water that you were working with, you had a higher probability of actually detecting the pathogen, the thing that you should actually be concerned about. And the same thing down in California, you went from 5% to 72% or here from 2% to 80%. So we have to start thinking when we're out there sampling and we're trying to manage the watershed, we're trying to think about how we're going to monitor the watershed, what is the goal? What is it we're looking for? And if we're actually concerned about pathogens, maybe we need to change how we sample for those. And in another study that we're doing right now in the Eastern Sierra, actually doing MST and looking at comparisons with indicators out here, a sub, I've pulled a subset of those samples here that these are just samples that were actually taken on streams that went right through grazed meadows. And even here, you don't see a correlation between the gene copies of a bovine signature right here and actual fecal coliforms in the water itself. And in here, this is taken from a 20 liter sample and this is taken from a 100 mil sample. And you see that it's kind of all over the place, that maybe you've got 10,000 gene copies when you only have you know, 600 fecal coliforms. Or maybe it's you have 1,000 and 1,000, it worked out really well here. So even looking at the correlation between the fecal coliforms, the thing that we're monitoring for, and the gene copies out there, the thing that we think is contributing to the water quality, don't <coughs> correlate really well. Though I've talked to others and I've seen plenty of studies where they correlate very nicely. You see that you have a large uh, 
fecal coliform load or an E. coli load, and it matches very perfectly with bovine gene copies that you're seeing or human gene copies that you're seeing. And once again, if I haven't said it enough, well, it's because it depends. It depends on where you are, it depends on when you sampled. And if you're in an area that you think there's a huge bovine contribution, you've got a CAFO that's down the road, you've got dairies with a leaky manure lagoon, or you've got you know, a human waste treatment plant, or you've got people that are all on septic, then in those areas where you already have a source in mind, you might actually see some correlations. But if you're still trying to get to know your watershed and you're not entirely sure where the contributions are coming from, then you're kind of like buckshotting it out there. You're just spitballing it and hoping that through your MST you're gonna figure out what the source is. And uh, I would suggest that you be a little bit careful because frequently you don't see the correlations. So then you wonder what's contributing to the rest of the fecal coliform loading out there if it's not necessarily coming from this thing that I targeted. And I hate to say this, because we tried to prove that this was wrong, because I hate having to deal with hold times. We work in a lot of remote locations, and we have to get the samples back to the lab where we have to process in the field. And I imagine a lot of you guys have to deal with the same issue. Either you're FedExing samples, somebody's got to physically transport them, you've got to somehow get them cooled down, stored, stabilized, because you've got standards that you have to adhere to. So we were kind of playing around with different media types that we were going to be working with. So we actually did comparisons for fecal coliforms and E. coli on several different types of media. And then we couched that into a, a hold time question as well. So from the moment of sampling, we took samples basically from water that ran behind campus so that we were like 10 minutes away processing them. And then um, followed them through time. And unfortunately, this little box is not showing up that well. This is the within that eight hour magical hold time that the EPA and others talk about a lot, is that you do see, you do start to get dropping off in these organisms during that time frame. Um, e. coli seems a little bit more stable during that time frame, but then does start to decline precipitously. But fecal coliforms, you can see right here, are kind of all over the place in that first six to eight hours, even some growth that takes place. And that's because, as I said in the beginning, fecal coliforms are a suite of organisms. And they all have their own ecology, they have their, their own biology, they're reacting differently to the conditions. Some of them are going to hate being in the four degree C refrigerator, others are going to thrive quite nicely. So you've got variability depending on the organism that you're testing for, how they are attenuating through time. So you have to think about that then too when you're doing your sampling protocol and you're coming up with your monitoring strategy. Um, what's reasonable? How quickly can you get your samples to the lab? What are you going to do when you're out there? How are you going to handle those samples? Maybe it takes you four hours just to collect all of your samples and then you've got a three hour drive back to your lab. You're going to have to start thinking strategies of how you are going to handle those samples. I hate to be the bearer of bad news on that one because I didn't like to hear that either. Finally, what you test for matters, and I think I've been elucidating this the whole entire time, is variability is everywhere. And then variability in the methodology also contributes to your answers. And I, Lucy's going to talk about this too. So briefly, all I'm going to say is that there have been studies out there that are actually comparing some of these methods that are out there, the different markers, the primer probe sets, what are the targets that they're looking for. You might recognize like bow back and back cow and Hume back and all back and all these different um, microbial source markers that are being used to actually uh, look for um, markers out in your environmental samples. So some people have actually done comparisons. And this study here, the Reicher study, was actually done in Europe and they did a transcontinental look at the efficacy of these two human markers. These two ones are human. These three ones right here Two of them are meant to be um, bovine, this one right here, and this one's ruminant. But in all reality, if you read any papers on this at all, anything that claims to be a bovine marker is really a ruminant marker. They've shown time and time again that there's a lot of cross-reactivity within a bovine marker with things like deer. You know, if you know you're in an area that is a high concentration of cattle and you've got a strong bovine signature, maybe you're comfortable saying it's probably the cows. But if you're in an area that maybe you've just got a couple ranches around or maybe hobby farms, but it's wilderness and so you've got a thriving deer, elk, moose, whatever population, and you've got a bovine signature, chances are it's ruminant and it's not that. So just keep in mind, if you read a lot of the literature right now, most of them are 
calling them ruminant signatures, not bovine signatures, so grain of salt there. So looking at these two different studies, this one is cross-continental, looked at six, six different continents, species of feces from all over the place. And this one, just looking at one little rangeland watershed in Canada, looking at the efficacy of these different markers. So these ones here, ruminant, this is human, this is ruminant, this is a cow ruminant one, horse one, and then all Bacteroidales here. What I want you to look at are these bottom lines, sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity, do you find it when it is there? Specificity, did you not find it when it was not there? So that's what we're talking about, false negatives, false positives, and those are the things to consider when you're developing your MST strategy. So you see over in this one little watershed, though they did 391 fecal samples, they found that the back hume right here, this, this human marker, 90% sensitive, so 90% of the time they found it um, when it was there, and then 100% of the time they didn't find something else. Um, so they had all these zeros right here. It's like it never lit up for moose or deer or goats or anything like that when you were looking for human. So the same exact marker right here, the same primer probe set right here used in this cross-continental study found 53% specificity and 77% sensitivity. So you see all here, they're like, it was lighting up for cattle right here and it lights up for other you know, like carnivores. So dogs are a big thing. One of the things that they think about is that a lot of domestic dogs, they live side by side humans. They might share food sources. So maybe they've got the same gut microbiota. And I don't know if you've heard about this at all, but some work that's being done at UC Davis has popped up on NPR and such where they're actually looking at dog um, gut microbiome and cat gut microbiome. And they're showing that our pets share a lot of our gut microbiome. It's not that surprising. We're like touching and kissing. I love my dog. I'm sure we share a lot of microbes. So it's not that surprising also that you might see this human marker started picking up on some of our domesticated animals. So it's something to keep in mind also is like what is the system you're working in? What might be some points of cross reactivity? And you're going to want to test those things before you adopt your strategy. So if you're in an area that you've got cows and sheep all intermingling together, go out and make sure your assay works for cows and is not reacting to sheep. Or if you know that You've got a huge deer population out there. Go do some scat, send your undergrads out or something, get some scat collection going on and actually incorporate those in the beginning of your assay development to determine your sensitivity and specificity because it depends where you are, how well these things are working. Final thing I'm going to say about you know, how you're actually processing matters is that it depends on whether or not you're actually doing presence absence or you're trying to quantify these markers out in the environment. Now, quantification of gene copies from your environmental samples is labor intensive and it's resource intensive and it requires you to do a lot of steps. For instance here, this is one of our um, spike trials that we did to come up with a standardized curve to calculate gene copies in our samples. And so you spike in a bunch of known concentrations of genes, actual DNA, and do them out in a dilution series and you run them all together to come up with your, your average. And you see here, even within color here, this is a single dilution, you got variability going on within your color. And you see between colors, obviously, as it goes this way, you're getting lower and lower concentrations. And if nobody's ever seen a PCR amplification plot before, basically this is cycles in the PCR. So the longer the PCR is running before you actually get amplification of those genes that you're looking for. Now, if you're doing presence absence, chances are you have a threshold. You have a cutoff value. And you say, I'm going to say any samples that didn't you know, reach my threshold until after 32 cycles, 32 is fairly common, you're gonna call that a negative sample. You're gonna say, I didn't find my marker because it didn't get there in 32 cy cycles. I'm too concerned that that's gonna be a false positive, so I'm gonna exclude it. But you can see, we spiked this in. I know this is positive. I know these ones are positive. I put it there. And they still showed up past the threshold area, so whether or not you're deciding that you're doing presence absence, whether or not you decide that you're actually trying to do quantification, um, that's going to determine your outcome and your reliability of your assays. So long story short, the science is still out there. There's a lot of things we don't know, um, persistence, transport, correlations that we talked about. So persistence, one study here, I thought this was a great study actually, 
Um, they actually did little uh, mesocosms where they, they spiked in known concentrations of these markers and E. coli into vessels and they put them out in streams for a couple of weeks so that they were exposed to the same environmental conditions. And then they went back and repeatedly sampled them and to saw how these different markers and E. coli uh, attenuated. What, how did they persist through time? So the thing was is that it depended. Not surprising, I'm saying it depends. So the first trial, you can see right here, it's hard to see what these little markers are, but the, the circle ones right here are E. coli. These ones with the little cross marks, asterisks on them are all backs, so or all bacteroid alleys, huge suite of organisms. And then these other ones right here are ruminant, cow, and human specific markers. And this is a log reduction right here. So here, two days, you see like all of these human ruminant cow markers dropped precipitously in this July. Um, trial that they did. And then the same trial that they conducted one month later, those same markers then persisted out, didn't get to the negative two reduction or negative three log reduction until you're out to like day nine or 10 or so out here. Um, but you can see the all back, the all back troidales, this big suite of organisms persisted for a longer period of time, just like E. coli. So the fact of the matter is, is that in this one study, they showed a huge amount of variability just in how long the markers are persisting out there. And this is just one set of markers. So that's something to consider also. A lot of research still needs to be done. We don't know how long these things can still be detected post-defecation. And if they're supposed to be indicative of a recent contamination event, we don't know what recent means. So keep that in mind. The other thing is transport. It's a busy slide right here, but basically it's supposed to say it's complicated. So we know this for bacteria. There are a lot of processes involved, whether you're talking hydrologic processes, you've got you know turbulence and mixing, and you've got geologic processes that are happening. You know, things are going down into the sediments and being remobilized and getting resuspended and attenuated by UV. And we don't really know how these transport processes are working for these microbial markers. Because once again, when we're talking about the markers, um, it's not just looking for bacteroides, how these transport mechanisms work for bacteroides, but how it actually works for the DNA as it's moving through. Because you might be able to detect the DNA after the organism is dead. And then right here, don't try to read all these numbers. These bolds didn't show up very well in here. The other thing, talking about the correlation between indicators and pathogens, um, we have the same problem probably with these markers and pathogens. The whole point, once again, is we're trying to manage our watershed to the most beneficial uses in reducing human illness. And right here, the only one you can see right here, so this is the, these numbers that are not in the brackets are the odds of actually detecting one of these pathogens when you find a marker for one of these organisms over here. And the things in brackets are the confidence intervals. And the only thing you really need to understand is that if those confidence intervals jump over one, that means that it's a negative and positive probability. And so it basically rules itself out. So it's not significant. So right here, only four times do you see it right here where this is over one here. And it doesn't bracket over the one. So you have a higher probability of finding salmonella when you have a human signature. It's not that surprising. If you find person poop in the water, chances are it's not a good thing. Ruminant right here with salmonella. And once again, it says ruminant. It doesn't say bovine. Ruminant right here. We know from our studies that salmonella is actually really hard to find in cow poop. But it's not that hard to find in deer poop. So that's something to keep in mind also. The same thing here is muskrat with campylobacter. Or here you have a negative probability. You have a, you know, almost a 70, a little more than 70% less likely to find cryptosporidium if you have Canada goose samples. So it's something to keep in mind also that these things don't necessarily correlate that well. And if they do correlate, it might depend on the bug and on the organism of interest. I'll quickly go to the end here because I know I was supposed to be 55 minutes, but we'll see. The idea is that, so you've done your MST, you've committed, you've said, I'm going to develop an MST, our district is going to do this kind of monitoring, and then you find cow poop in your water. And then you have to figure out, well, what does that mean? What do I do? How do I move forward from there? And so most of the research we actually do is actually helping ranchers, helping irrigation districts, helping all kinds of agencies 
come up with management strategies of how do you actually fix the problem, not just find the problem, how do you fix the problem. So as I'm sure you guys all know and have to do when you're managing your lands, is that an increase in the number of management practices that helps improve water quality moves your water generally from the high risk category down to the low risk. And then there's always time and distance. Move the risk further away from the water, keep it further away in time, whether that means it gets aged, all those things work to reduce the risk of your water. So some of those things include like putting in grassed buffer strips. Research that was done on um, a rangeland uh, research station for UC Davis a few years ago looking at the efficacy of grassed buffers to remove bacteria from fecal pats. And we know that it works, and it works pretty well. So we know that when you've got a cow pat that's out there on a range that's sloped and it flows over the land, Within like the first foot or so, 90% of the E. coli are trapped and retained. And if 90% of the E. coli are trapped and retained, chances are that 90% of the other bacteria, and so you might not ever have like the signature leak out of the cow pat if you just give a little distance between where the cows are pooping and where the water is. And all of this attenuation and trapping increases as you move the cow pat further and further away from the water. So just within one foot here, you see this huge reduction. So it's something to keep in mind too, if you have a way to manage the cattle so that there's an increase in this buffer distance, you'll improve your water quality. Same way goes here, if you actually manage your grazing or ha help ranchers manage their grazing to actually distribute the feces away from the water, you're likely to improve your water quality and reduce the amount of signatures that you see, these bovine or ruminant signatures that you see out there. So whether that's making sure that they can't get down to the water when they're actually grazing or encouraging them to graze out in the sunny areas or further away from the water by putting out salt licks or putting a separate source of water for the cattle to use. Um, when you move the, the poop out into a bright sunny spot and it bakes in California heat, turns out the bacteria die pretty quickly. And in the beginning, fresh fecal pats, you kind of have an increase in bacterial growth. In the beginning, you got this crisp little outer surface that keeps it moist inside and it gets all nice and warm and incubated and so it grows in the beginning, but slowly, you know, the bacteria get unhappy and it starts to get a little too hot, a little too dry. You have precipitous drop. So if there's some way that you can actually manage your lands where the feces are allowed environmental exposure for a longer period of time prior to maybe irrigating or prior to being exposed to overland flow, you're likely to improve your water quality. You're even better if you've got um, your rangeland meets up with a wetland because well, wetlands actually are great filters of bacteria. We know that in a functioning wetland, one that hasn't been overly channelized so the water can't rapidly move through it and it has to percolate through, are great at reducing microbial loads in associated water bodies. So we're not entirely sure how this works for microbial markers yet, but like I said, if it works for indicator bacteria, it might also work for these microbial markers. And really, if you're um, monitoring for microbial markers and indicators at the same time, it doesn't it shouldn't trigger any you know, regulatory action if you're not exceeding the regulatory standard. Even if you're finding a bovine signature, but you're not exceeding the regulatory standard of E. coli or fecal coliforms, then it shouldn't raise any red flags. So if you're able to at least reduce the E. coli that's out there, then you don't have regulators breathing down your back. But really, you guys have to decide individually within your districts, within your boards, what's the best move for you. Do you have high priority watersheds? Do you have watersheds of particular concern because they're used for irrigation or they're used for drinking water? Then you should probably do microbial monitoring if you're not already. If you've been doing microbial monitoring and you know you've got microbial contamination problems, you should ask yourself whether or not you have a suspected source. Do you know who might be the contributors or are you just like, I don't know where it's coming from? You probably want to hold off on MST until you've done a little bit of investigation to figure out what a potential source is because like I said, then you're just spitting into the wind. It's just buckshot. You're not sure what's causing the loading out there and every single marker that you add to your assay makes the price go up. Also, you know, if you have a suspected source, you know, MST could be a good option, but you might want to actually, if you know that there's a potential source, like you know that that particular dairy down there might be the source, you might consider management strategies on the dairy prior to investing into MST 
Now, if you have human health is issues actually out there, you've got a community of high concern or it, drinking water is being implicated and you're actually worried about human health, then you might just do yourself a favor and invest in looking for pathogens. It's really what you care about. It might not be what you're regulated on, but it's actually what you care about, or at least I'm assuming you do, because why else do we care about bacteria and water if it doesn't make us sick? Unless you're me. I'm an ecologist, so I care. But Finally, at the very end, though, is that you are the ones that know the resources that are at your disposal. You know, can you guys collaborate? Are you guys able to pool samples to send to a lab so you get a reduced rate? Um, does one district maybe have an in-house lab that will do fee-for-service for another district that can't get their samples to a faraway location? And so determining what resources you have at your disposal is really going to help you determine whether or not investing in MST is the best strategy. Or you could just train your cows to use the commode. But so and that's it. I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, do you have any feel for um, management practice of water gaps? I mean, focused uh, exposure to water versus along the whole stream exposure to a source? Right, so you're talking about whether or not there's a specific area that that feces is likely to come in contact with the water. Practice, mm -hmm. Water gaps versus the entire stream is open to uh, Right, so in terms of water gaps, I mean, the work that we've done has really been improvement in riparian vegetation in a particular area of concern, maybe restoration of some wetlands in the area. Um, if we know there's an area that's sensitive to contamination, maybe actually putting in some localized fencing to deter direct contamination so you don't have the ability of wildlife or cattle or pack horses to cross a stream in that particular area where there's focused attention to an area of particular concern because it's really hard obviously to manage an entire watershed. Um, sometimes what is most effective is doing um, multiple points along a watershed, areas of key concern, maybe right where you've got um, a merging of two streams together. You know, if you're doing your practice right above where there's another influx of water further down, um, all of your management might be for naught if you've got contribution coming from this other stream. So looking at key points along the stream is something we found to be effective, but really um, improving the actual ecology of the system through um, riparian vegetation, wetland restoration, making sure that you don't have areas that are being um, excavated or scoured unnecessarily um, where you know cattle have come through and like trampled the bank line or something like that seems to be an effective strategy. And the, and that question, consider testing for actual pathogens. I thought of that a couple of years ago and then I thought it was I don't know, crazy. I mean, I thought, what, what does it matter? Because <laughs> the structure I mean, it's E. coli is what we're regulated for. Who currently are you being regulated by? We have uh, standards through the, the, the Department of Environmental Quality. Okay, so the, your Wyoming's Department of Environmental Quality is the one who's actually doing spot checks regulating and then has to come with the bad news of saying you exceeded some standard. I'm asking because I literally don't know in Wyoming how you're being regulated. I mean, it could be a conservation district that has data that um, mm -hmm. shows that you have an impairment. I mean, you need to collect a, a now it's a 60-day geometric mean. I feel for you and I agree with you. And as a researcher, I can say, I don't care about regulations, but I work with a lot of growers and ranchers, irrigation districts, conservation districts. Um, shellfish growers that say that's all well and great, but we're still being regulated on this. And uh, that's why we actually work with the EPA and the FDA and other regulatory authorities, and our data is actually going into new regs. Unfortunately, they don't always listen to us. So like the FDA now has gotten involved in the regulatory you know, deal with um, FSMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, where they're regulating irrigation water supplies. And um, so we fought very long and hard with them and presented plenty of data that they crunched the numbers on to determine whether or not it was better to have mandatory pathogen testing versus indicator path testing. And at the end, they balked and they went back to, they're using EPA methods right now. So they're doing indicator testing. And so all I can tell you is that we as scientists are continuing to push the regulators to say it doesn't matter. You're asking people to test for things that don't matter 
please listen to us. I understand that you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. The science is telling you one thing. The regulators are telling you another thing. So um, what I would say, you know, if you have resources and the things you're actually can, concerned about, instead of doing an MST, you might consider looking at pathogens, and pathogens can help tell you who the contributor is. If you're looking for pathogens, um, certain pathogens are only going to show up with certain contributors. So if you decide that you're going to monitor for cryptosporidium, say, a certain species of cryptosporidium are only associated with certain organisms, not all of them are zoonotic. So if you're finding a particular species of cryptosporidium, as an example, you can say, well, that's probably not cows because that's found in ground squirrels that kind of thing. So it could help you decide, not only are you understanding the actual human health risk associated with your water sample, but it can help you determine who might be the likely contributor. And then actually have something to say to when they come knocking on your door also. Give the regulators additional information saying that you have been doing your due diligence and you are trying to track down potential contributing sources. I don't even know where to go test the actual pathogens. And, I mean, I've heard that it can be really costly and difficult to sample for. So um, who does your, who's your lab right now? Do you have a, like an independent lab as a private contractor? Or? No, we do our own coal alert. OK, so you're doing the coal alert packets right there. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to you more about it, because I'm getting a little signal right yep. here, about mm -hmm. developing an assay for what pathogens you think you might be concerned about. Okay. Great. Yep. Thanks.